Okay. There we go. So, is anybody curious how something like this could happen 30 years ago to a beer drinking kid from New Jersey? I'm America's first master sommelier. I mean, how does that happen? Or some of you got to be wondering, what on earth is talking about wine going to do for you to be a better entrepreneur? Well, let's talk about that. This was posted in the, wine, in the Wall Street Journal. Wine at business meals is a skirmish in a boardroom war. Played out on a linen tablecloth, your handling of wine, whether ordering it or just drinking it, matters more than you think to your colleagues. Sometimes people see your comfort or expertise with wine not as a comment on your knowledge, but on your character. Food and wine, the international currency for connection. You like the way that sounds? You know who wrote that? Sam Horn. Two years ago, Sam Horn helped me design a proposal to query publishers in New York to get a book out called Power Entertaining. And yesterday in New York City, I signed the deal with John Wiley and Sons. So if you don't know Sam Horn and you can be around this weekend to see her, you want to know her. She's a very, very helpful person. Anyway, now here's the picture, you know. How did I become America's first master sommelier? I grew up in New Jersey, got a degree in psychology, took a summer off and went to Hawaii to see what it was like. I liked it a whole lot more in New Jersey. So I got myself into graduate school so I could tell my parents I was working on my master's degree. And I took a job at night working in a restaurant to support myself. Life was good. Until one night, the maitre d' came up and hung this chain on my neck because the sommelier Pierre was sick. And he said, he hung, hung out my neck and said, Eddie, you're, up. you're it. This is it. I said to the guy, no, don't do it. Don't even think about going here. I drank beer. I've never seen a wine list. I can't do that. The guy says, you can. Red wine, it goes with meat. <laughs> White wine, you serve that with fish. And if he's not sure, you pitch him a little rosé. <laughs> guy was serious. So I went out in the restaurant and I'm, you know, guys are calling me over and saying, hello, sir, my wife's having scampi and I'm having the rack of lamb medium rare. What would you suggest? And I'd say, I point to this one wine down there, number 131, Chateau Belgraves. It's a Bordeaux, nice and fruity with a crisp, clean finish. <laughs> At the end of the night, I don't know if you measure how you're doing in the restaurant, but you sit down, you pull all the cash out of your pocket, and you count it. I'm counting a pile of money that night. It's more money than I've ever made, and I don't know jack. Not a freaking thing about wine. I'm going, how cool is that? Well, <laughs> then I decided to change things, and I fast-forwarded real quickly. What I did was I moved to France. And I attended the School of Enology at the University of Bordeaux. It took me a year to learn the language and then spent three years getting, getting to be a professional wine taster. And I came back and I worked as a sommelier, you know, like in Honolulu in New York City and what typical sommeliers do. But there's 118 masters now. I was the first one 30 years ago. But I've kind of spun it out differently and I work sort of as an executive coach. I design dinners, I execute dinners, I give 50 dinners a year around the country, but more than that, I coach people to do it better than others. Because you know, people like to hang around with CEOs, people like to hang with uh, athletes, professional athletes, they like to hang around with celebrities because I hope some of that stuff rubs off. You know what? People like to hang around with you if you do chicken better. <laughs> if you do food and wine events better, because most people play it safe. Most people go to a food and beverage director and putting on a big event and say we have $80,000 in the budget. You don't ever want to be saying it that way because th then you're handed off all the power and they're in business and to keep their jobs to do the lowest food costs, the lowest wine costs, the lowest labor costs possible and you don't get a deal. So you've got to get better at this. So when you're doing an event, for EO, some of the elements are important. It's got to be fun, and I talk about how to do that. It's got to be educational, because a sommelier goes to a table and you're creating an experience for people. You're trying to take them to a new level. And of course, it's got to have takeaway value, which seldom do they have. You know, as you're putting your business plans together with your company, you're looking at the consumers you're trying to sell to and your competition, you're thinking about the strategies that are going on. You're trying to balance all these things. You know. Likewise, when you're looking at your, your business and the components, you're trying to measure you know, what's going to happen with the profit versus the revenue, you know, how much is it going to cost, and again, you're trying to get that, that balance in there. We know wine is really the same way. Let's talk about red wine, for example. 
Any red wine, I don't care if you like California wine, Italian wine, French wine, has three components of flavor. Bitterness from tannins, sourness from acidity, and fruitiness from sweetness. And alcohol and sugar give it the sweetness component, and every wine has to have just enough of each one of them so that it tastes as a chemical symphony, it's all in harmony. And again, about 90% of wines are not in balance. The wines you want to be serving, the wines you want to be tasting, the wines you want to be buying by the case must be balanced. And that's the only question you've got to ask yourself. So I'm doing a workshop tomorrow at 9 o'clock, and we'll be doing some tasting and having foods, and it's kind of fun. But let's, let me just show you a couple of quick things that are important. For example, if someone was to serve you a lobster bisque in a restaurant and it was lukewarm, you'd send it back. It's not, you know, it's not acceptable. If someone serves you, or if you serve someone, a red wine and it's not slightly chilled, that's an insult. Because in order for wine to be in balance, it has to be somewhat sweet, the fruitiness. And here, if you take a look at this diagram of sweetness, you'll see that at room temperature, wine is not very sweet. But as it starts to get colder, you take anything that's sweet and chill it, it becomes sweeter. So all red wines need to be in a refrigerator for 20 minutes before you serve them. They never are in restaurants, so you have to ask them to chill it. Or you need to own a, you know, a Sub-Zero or a Viking component in your home where you have your wine at the right temperature. Sometimes people wonder, like, how would I know? I would never know the difference between one wine and the other. Sure you would, but you've got to understand that wine has three waves of flavor, a foretaste, a middle taste, and an aftertaste. The French call it the attack, the evolution, the finish. And the rule would be very simple. The longer the aftertaste, the better the wine. We give us stopwatches when we're in school over there. Another thing that's very important is when you want to show off wines to people, you want to teach them something, have to have take away knowledge about it, the best way to do it is to serve them two wines so they have something to compare and contrast. You have a little you know, homework, experiment, and you serve these wines before the food. What does everybody else do? They bring the food and then they pour the wine. If you serve the wine after the food, the wine becomes an afterthought. People treat it like a beverage. Wine is not a beverage. If you come to the seminar tomorrow, you're going to see that wine is a condiment. It's like lemon juices to fish, or salt and pepper are to a steak, or ketchup to french fries. You need to have wine and food together, and you actually have to con consume them together. You have, to sip, you have to eat some food and sip some wine in at the same time to see what the wine can do for the food. So it's, 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 it's pretty interesting how they put that together. Here's another thing that they showed us in Bordeaux, and that is when you smell something and you breathe in, that's called the direct nasal canal. But when you taste something, the wine, for example, or the food comes in, lands on your tongue, your body's 98 degrees and it warms up. And as you swallow, some of those aromas get squeezed back up against the olfactory nerve. So everything tastes at its best at the moment you swallow. Everything, if you judge 10 wines, you don't judge them until you swallow them. Then you mark the, the grade. Why do you care about this? Here's what they taught us. They said, what you really need to do is to put something in your mouth to evaluate it. And as soon as you put it in your mouth and swallow it, close your lips and exhale backwards out your nose. It's called retronasal in French, back breathing. And as unorthodox as this may sound, you can try it later at dinner or tomorrow in the workshop, you will not believe how food tastes better in reverse. And these are just tactics that are kind of fun and things that are fun to teach your clients and show people. Let's just talk about a couple of things real quickly when you're putting together, you know, what do you need to know when you put together an event, you're talking to a restaurant or a hotel or whatever. You gotta know their wine list, it's on the website. You don't wanna go in and you know, try to decide at the last minute with the food and beverage director. You wanna study it and see what's there. You wanna bond with the sommelier, the guy or the gal who's in charge of everything. You wanna go down to that restaurant and you wanna taste, pre-taste if you can. If they're in the same town, great. Go down and pre-taste things like you would if you're you know, sampling stuff for a wedding and bond with them because once they know what you wanna do, then they can create magic. But if you go in at the last minute, I call don't let the restaurant happen to you. Always want to use a private dining room. Having fine wine in a big, huge dining room with a lot of people, it's too, not, too loud. You can't see the subtleties of the wine. You want the power. You need to be you know, in, in that uh, private room. What else we got here? So I, what I do is when I do an event, I ask the hotel to put all the, walk, all the red wines in the walk-in refrigerator the night before the event. They, they balk at that. They're kind of crazy. They say, I I got room, but that's what you want. You want to use better glassware. If you have to, rent them. Reed will rent them for like a dollar a stem. Much more powerful. You want to decant all your red wines. Always use a decanter, whether you're at an event or at home. Don't use one of those little spinners you all got in Christmas. You, know, you got your, your suitcase, you know, some propeller head, you know, design. You pour it through a little Venturi. That's not cool, okay? It's not, you, it's, it's not to use one. I didn't have time to decant. 
You call the restaurant up and you say, I want to have the 89 Lynch Vage. Open it at 5 o'clock tomorrow. Here's my credit card. So you've paid for it already. It's already decanted. It's already at the right temperature. It's ready to go. That's what you got to do to make things work. Use magnums. They're much more powerful. They don't have them. Order them. Plan it up ahead. You know, don't smell the cork. It smells like cork with wine on the end of it. <laughs> you, you know, you smell the wine. That's what's important. You know, tip with cash. You know, so often people don't understand. You know, like you're going to you're going to cruise ship, and at the, at the on the 13th day of the cruise ship, they put these white little envelopes in your cruise cabin to at the tip envelopes. No, no, no. You go night number one. You get on that cruise. You look for the guy who's rubbernecking you, trying to figure out because he's got 40 people to take care of. They all come in at four, at 7:30. He's got to take care of somebody first and somebody last. So he's looking at your jewels, your watch, your shoes, whatever, or the hundred dollar bill you feed him the first night. Going, I'm on table 26. Make it happen. You know. I have checklists. Uh, I have a booklet that uh, you can have tomorrow at the workshop, or I'll give you another way to get it in a second, that goes over all the things you need to look at as far as what kind of glassware, what kind of corkage policies. If, you, if you're booking an event, you've got 200 people you know, coming to the event, well, you have a lot of leverage and a lot of power. And you need to say to them, I don't want to pay for the wines, or I, I don't want to pay a corkage fee. You, these things are all negotiable, but people don't do that. You know, it's not a bad idea to take a look at the cadavers. That's the bottles that were used, because how do you know at the end of your event that the 47 bottles of champagne were poured? How do you know? It's okay to be anal about it and say, I want to see them. I want to line them up in boxes, because not that they're going to cheat you, but <laughs> it's, it's happened. <laughs> you know, don't just pour any old mineral water. You know, use, use Vichy Catalan or something special. I mentioned that before. You know, just kind of winding things up here. We're talking about business. You know, and everybody's got to grow their business. And businesses are founded upon relationships between people who trust each other. I kind of call them trusted allies. You know, and it's the most important aspect of everything. And, you know, you look at what Margaret Wheatley said here, you know, the capacities to form them are more important than the tasks or the functions, the roles or positions. I mean, to form these relationships is critical. And my question to you is, what kind of strategy do you have to form more relationships? Let me make a few suggestions here. You know, what you need to be doing is constantly renewing or rekindling current relationships so that they don't fall off the radar screen. Au contraire, you need to be trying to discover new ones, and how are you doing that? Well, you could go play golf with somebody, but that takes five hours, and you can only take four people out at a time, but it works. You know, you might join some philanthropic fundraiser and meet new people who join them in your hood that way. Maybe you'll buy a, a book, Never Eat Alone, by Keith Ferrazzi. Some of you must have, have that one. I mean, he's, he, that's all he's talking about, relationships with people over food and wine. You know? So my suggestion is you learn how to take these people out and you power entertain them with strategies that are important. You leave them with takeaways. Here's a menu I just did last week for YPO in Chicago. It's a passport. And it's got all the wines and all the foods and everything, 24 pages long. Why do I do this? Because if someone comes to your event and you've got great food and wines, you want them to be able to repeat that at home. And if you don't give them something to take away, they're not going to do it. If you print an 8.5 by 11 menu, they throw it away. It's got to be distilled down. It's got to be compact. It's got to be like that. You know? It's very simple. You need to train your sales and marketing staff, if you do any corporate entertaining at all, how to do this, because then you'll be flying at an altitude higher than everybody else. And that's the key, is just, you know, winning. <laughs> you want to be up there beating the other people. I was just bringing that up. Also, introduce the element of surprise. About a couple of years ago, I threw a surprise birthday party for myself. <laughs> no, no, nobody else offered it up, so. I decided to throw this party, and I, anyway, I brought my friends. I always take my, my really good friends or key clients to a place in a limo. I take them home in a limo, so nobody has to play designated driver, et cetera. So I told my friends I was going to pick them up, and I drove them downtown. I live in San Diego. And we went down on Restaurant Row on Fifth Avenue, went into the first restaurant, and they didn't have our name on the book, so we had to all back out, get back in the car, went to the second one. They didn't know what was going on. My friends were looking at me like, what's going on here? I said, you know, I didn't like any of those restaurants. Let's go to the other one. I had one more in mind. We pulled up in front of this one. And you had to see my friend's faces going, no, 
effing way. <laughs> I go, get on. Times are, times are wasting in a hurry. And so the thing, thing takes off with music playing, and now I got Magnus of Don Perignon coming out of the back, and Alan Parsons is playing, and someone says, Eddie, where are we going? I said, how does San Francisco sound? 45 minutes into the flight, people are looking at the window going, Eddie, I don't see the water anymore. And one guy looks at the right window and goes, Eddie, that's, a, that's a Eiffel Tower down there, man. That's not San Francisco. I said, sweetheart, I just said, how does San Francisco sound, baby? <laughs> We're going to Vegas. It's my birthday. <laughs> There's a big story to that. Anyway, I'm trying to develop some synergies with EO. I like, if you notice my logo, E and O works for me. I've only done one, I've only done one presentation for EO, but it got, in Orange County, it got a 9.7, but I started with Vistage and I did a couple and all of a sudden I've done 235 with them and I've done a bunch with YPO, so I'm hoping that, you know, I can get some traction with you guys. And for what it's worth, and I think you should always do this for your audiences, if you like where I'm going, if you like the PowerPoint show, if you can't make tomorrow's, I have this number, text me 66746 and put in the copy line, wine plus your email address. I'll send you digital copies of this booklet, or you, you can have hard copies. I've got a hundred of them here. Um, I'll send you both PowerPoint presentations so that you have the same stuff you can show off to your friends, because otherwise you're not going to remember but 15% of what I said. No one does in a PowerPoint presentation. Anyway, thank you very much.